While all eyes have been on New York, specifically, of course, Manhattan this week with regard to Donald Trump's legal problems, his legal problems in Washington, D.C. with the federal grand jury and special prosecutor Jack Smith have gotten decidedly worse. Former aide Ken Cuccinelli was spotted going in to speak to the grand jury on Tuesday, shortly after the three-judge panel in D.C. ruled that Trump could not bar his former aides from testifying. But more importantly, a new report came out this week where sources close to the grand jury investigation spoke to CNN, where they said that at least two separate former Trump aides, or cabinet members really, have told the grand jury that Donald Trump knew without a doubt that what he was attempting to do to overturn the election results was 100% illegal. I've been a Starbucks barista at HMS Holes and O'Hare for nearly 17 years. I wake up every day at 12.30 in the morning to work at one of the busiest Starbucks in Illinois. There are mornings where I work alone, and from the start, there's a line of 30 or more people asking, when will I open? We are so understaffed that it makes my job harder because I have to keep all the regular pots going while also taking specialty orders and food orders. Now, it's easy to imagine how being fully staffed would change things at Starbucks. Recently, because of a store closure, employees got shuffled around. We had enough staff for just one week. I was able to get off work on time and spend time with my family. Every week should be like that. Unfortunately, the next week, the company reopened that store, and we had too much work to do again. At my company, HMSOs, fewer of us are doing more work than we did before the pandemic. Let me be clear. Though we're understaffed, we don't have a worker shortage. We have a good job shortage here in O'Hare Airport. Some of you may know we had your boss, Mr. Schultz, in front of our committee uh, the other day. And it is clear to me uh, that Starbucks, uh, where you have some 300 shops that are voted to form a union, they have not yet negotiated a contract with one of those shops. And it is clear to me, and I think to all of you, we know what's going on. They're doing everything that they can to try to break unions. The National Labor Relations Board made that, I think, pretty abundantly uh, clear. So to answer your question, Anna, what we are trying to do is pass what is called the PRO Act, which essentially protects the rights of workers to organize and is part of that to get a first contract in a timely manner. Because what many of these companies do, they have all the money, they have all the lawyers, they have all the resources, you don't have that. So they stall and stall and stall and people quit, right? And people give up. And that's how they win. And people, you know, say, hey, what, what good did it do us? We formed the union, we don't, we're not any better off. That's what their intention is. So what this law says, if you don't sit down and negotiate a first contract in a reasonable period of time, you will be fined. If you try to force workers into back rooms for propaganda efforts, you will be fined. If you fire workers for organizing, you will be fined. If you threaten to close down your shop, you will be fined. So this is an effort to try to give workers the protection they need to organize and to negotiate uh, decent contracts. Now, on this one, I think we have almost all Democratic support. Very, very hard to win uh, Republican support, but we're going to do everything we can to try to get this uh, passed. All right, now we've got the governor of California, Gavin Newsom. Thanks so much for coming on. Hey, it's great to be with you. Now, you visited students in New College in Florida. That is the epicenter of Governor Ron DeSantis' efforts to reshape the state in his conservative mold. How are the students viewing this pretty blatant conservative indoctrination effort? Well, I mean, that's exactly what it is. They want to bring us back to a pre-1960s world, period, full stop. And you hear that loudly and clearly from faculty, staff. You hear it loudly and clearly from community leaders that we met with, not just the students themselves. They feel under assault. They feel anxious. Um, they feel... Uh, challenge in terms of just dealing with what they have to deal with every single day as being a young student, just trying to learn. Yeah. Um, they have parents in some cases that want them back home because they don't want them to be part of this fight. Others are doubting that they have the resilience and strength to be part of this fight. Yet all of them are just bewildered that they're being used as a pawn in a political game to try to reshape higher education across this country. And make no mistake, that's what this is about, period, full stop. This is a full-on assault of higher education and for academic freedom. And this is about reshaping higher education, which many of these guys like DeSantis think is some damn establishment plot. A weak guy masquerading as if he's a strong guy. So he takes on the most vulnerable consistently, a 700 person college. He takes on, he has to find migrants in another state. I mean, just think about it. He goes to another state to find migrants under false pretense and sends them to an island. He decides to have his own police force and go out and arrest people uh, early in the morning in their underwear uh, because they filled out the wrong form. Everything this guy does, going after the LGBTQ community, going after, even trying to take, I mean, everything this guy does has that in common, trying to humiliate, trying to bully other people. And this is consequential, though, because if he's successful here, it will have an impact and reverberate in other states and other institutions. And as a guy that you know, runs the UC system and the CSU Board of Trustees, the greater conveyor belt for talent, of public education, higher learning, anywhere on the globe, this is a serious, serious moment, and that's why I'm here to call it out, and all of academia should be calling this out. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas is facing renewed calls for his impeachment after a ProPublica investigation revealed he failed to report frequent luxury trips paid for by a billionaire Republican mega donor named Harlan Crow, who serves on the board of the right-wing American Enterprise Institute. The investigation reveals that for about 20 years, Thomas secretly accepted luxury vacations from Crow, an apparent violation of a law requiring justices and other federal officials to disclose most gifts. One vacation involved nine days of island hopping in Indonesia aboard a 162 two-foot superyacht. Clarence Thomas and his wife, Ginny Thomas, flew to Indonesia on Crow's private jet. Thomas also frequently vacationed at Crow's 105-acre resort in the Adirondacks of New York. 
hanging on the walls of the resort, is a painting of Clarence Thomas sitting with four other men, including Harlan Crowe, as well as Leonard Leo of the Federalist Society. Thomas never reported any of the free trips as gifts. On Thursday, New York Congress member Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez tweeted, quote, this is beyond party or partisanship. This degree of corruption is shocking, almost cartoonish. Thomas must be impeached, she said. No one has ever accused House Judiciary Chairman Jim Jordan of being smart. And based on his latest subpoena, no one will ever accuse Jim Jordan of being smart. See, Jim Jordan has realized, as I've said uh, this past week, that he can't go after uh, Alvin Bragg up in Manhattan. You know, he has, has no federal dollars. He's not a federal employee. So there's nothing Jim Jordan can do to make that guy come and testify. Even if he subpoenas him, he can challenge it in court and Bragg's going to win. But Jim Jordan, aha, he thinks he's smart. He's like, well, what if I get somebody that doesn't work for you, Alvin Bragg? What if I find somebody who used to work for you, but doesn't anymore and is out there doing a media tour? Then they'll have to come and testify. So, aha, I got you. And I'm sending a subpoena, which Jim Jordan did late last week, to Mark Pomerantz. The former prosecutor who famously resigned from Alvin Bragg's team last year because he was so frustrated that Bragg was not moving forward with indictments against Donald Trump for financial crimes. Jim, are you trying to convince the public that Donald Trump is a horrible criminal that should be locked behind bars forever? I don't know what you want him to say, but I can promise you whatever it is you want him to say, he ain't going to say it. And that's going to be in the congressional record at that point. When it comes to abortion, it's taxpayer-funded abortion up to the moment of birth. That's barbaric. That's like China. That's like North Korea. We can win this issue at the ballot box if we show up with reasonable positions. If we have our head in the sand, we're going to lose. I'm watching all the coverage, which is part of the job. And um, Trump's going to speak. Everybody's, you know, Trump to speak at Mar-a-Lago. And on MSNBC, just before he starts, Rachel Maddow says this. This is basically a campaign speech in which he is repeating his same lies and allegations against his perceived enemies. It is just getting started. Um, so far, he's just giving his normal list of grievances. We don't consider that necessarily newsworthy. So MSNBC attacks Trump, I don't know, 23 and a half hours a day, and then decrees that his viewers shouldn't see his speech for 25 minutes, because that would be horrible, uh, even though MSNBC could then spend the next 23 hours attacking the speech, whatever they think is false. What do you think of the way they just sort of said we're not taking this no way, no how? I think it's really insulting, not just bad for business, but bad for media. I mean, that speech got really big ratings for a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. And the question, though, is the newsworthiness of a speech from a presidential candidate, a leading presidential candidate, is not determined by how smart you think your audience is, by your perception of your audience's ability to interpret it responsibly. And that's what Rachel Maddow is saying. You, know, you the audience, can't be trusted to know that this guy might be exaggerating like politicians do. He might be making things up. He might be saying things X, Y. That's not her no job. No politician has ever done that. <laughs> right, yeah. right. And that's not her job. That's the audience's job. So I think it's insulting um, and strange that after the Trump era, we're almost 10 years into it at this point, they still haven't learned that lesson and have doubled down on bad decisions. Yeah, in fairness, other MSNBC shows, particularly the next day, ran clips of the speech. I mean, how could you not? You mm -hmm. want to talk about what he had to say, and then you can critique it. That's what journalists do. Liz, it seems almost condescending to me. You know, we don't want you to hear what the Republican frontrunner has to say because you might fall for it. I'm wondering if Emily would think it's insulting that Fox News in the past has decided on occasion not to cover... Imagine an America overrun by liberal progressives. An America where everyone gets a free education and free health care. Imagine what might happen if everyone was paid a daily stipend, regardless of whether they worked or not want to see what maybe they felt was going to be the same old grievances mm -hmm. or some lies. You know, President Trump going out there, Howie, and saying that this doesn't happen in first world nations, only third world nations. Well, actually, it does, if you're going to fact check that. Nicolas Sarkozy and Jacques Chirac of France right. both were prosecuted and convicted. Okay. Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel went through a trial on yeah. bribery charges. Uh, Silvio Berlusconi of Italy. This does happen in first world nations. So, okay. you know, well, decisions you know, are made for different Reasons. When Fox didn't take the two January 6th committee hearings in prime time, I was critical of that. They did run all the other daytime hearings. And so I just think let the viewers decide. They're smart and you don't have to uh, shield them from this sort of thing. Thanks so much, Emily Jasinski and Liz Klayman. Good to see you as always. Up Aerial reconnaissance of the Ukrainian 46th Separate Airmobile Brigade corrects the night shooting of Russians.
On one of the Donetsk waste heaps, an FPV kamikaze drone of the 35th Separate Brigade of the Ukrainian Marine Corps and an observation post of the occupiers met warmly. And apparently, a really good way to mobilize people in a democracy is by trying to strip that democracy away. And so now, for the first time in 15 years, liberals control the court in Wisconsin, which may very well mean that if and when we see new maps, liberals may then control the entire state legislature in Wisconsin. And even better, uh, as far as this race is concerned, among students, their turnout was between 74% and 97% of general election turnout. That means they virtually matched turnout for a spring state Supreme Court race. That is quite literally unheard of. At the University of Wisconsin-Madison, that turnout number was as high as 97% of fall turnout. At uh, University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire, it was 91% of fall turnout. UW-Green Bay had 78% of turnout. And in those precincts, Judge Janet got 75 to 85% of the vote. Young people are turning out and they are voting for Democrats. Which, by the way, is why Republicans are trying their hardest to restrict voting on college campuses. And that, I should note, is the dumbest thing I could think of. Because guess what happens to college students after a few years when they graduate? They leave that campus knowing that the only reason that their right to easily cast a ballot was stripped away from them is because of the Republican Party. Like, talk about losing the future. In fact, here's uh, former Governor Scott Walker identifying that young voters are the problem, and here's the excuse that he gives. The larger issue here, we've seen it particularly in Wisconsin, but across the country, is younger voters. In Wisconsin, last fall, we saw about a 40-point margin that younger voters gave to the Democrats running for Senate and governor. We saw similar margins in Pennsylvania. Part of the reason why you have John Fetterman in the U.S. Senate, in Arizona, in Georgia, and elsewhere. And just this week in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. we don't yet know the numbers by age, but we do know that Dane County, uh, which is where the University of Wisconsin's flagship campus is at, about 50,000 students are enrolled there. Dane County cast more ballots in the race for the Supreme Court than the largest county in the state, Milwaukee County. And in Dane County, 82% of those votes went for the radical. And so unless we turn young people around, and it's not as simple as one campaign ad or some sort of a coalition, this is years of liberal indoctrination coming home to roost. And we've got to turn it around if we're going to win again. Ah, yes, that must be it. They're just being indoctrinated with liberal dogma. Definitely doesn't have anything to do with the fact that Republicans are employing a literal fascist agenda. That they're banning books, that they're banning abortion, banning interstate travel, banning medicine, banning drop boxes in interstate travel. No, it must be uh, those liberal professors. Like, in a way, while all of this is ridiculous, I listen to someone like Scott Walker and I'm relieved because their complete lack of self-awareness, their complete inability to correctly identify the problem means they will continue to lose. And that was put on full display in Tennessee. <laughs>
the audit that they have in, in the military doesn't really look at um, whether or not there's efficacy. It's just whether they got delivered the thing that they ordered. And that, is, that is any audit. That is any audit. That is true. But generally, those audits aren't $400 billion for Raytheon and $1.7 trillion for a plane that doesn't seem to be doing. Like, there is a lot of waste, fraud, and abuse within a system. Audits and waste, is, fraud, and abuse are not the same thing. So let's uh, decompose these things. Please educate me on, on Sure. So an audit is exactly what you just described, yes. which is do I know what was delivered to which place? Right. The ability to pass an audit or in a, the fact that the DOD has not passed an audit is not suggestive of waste, fraud, and abuse. That is completely false right there. So, so what now it's a question about? of, it's suggestive that we can't, we don't have an accurate inventory that we can pull up of what we have where. That is not the same as saying we can't do that because waste, fraud, and abuse has occurred. So in my world, yeah. that's waste. How is that waste? If I give you a billion dollars and you can't tell me what happened to it, that to me is wasteful. That, that means you well, are not <laughs> responsible. But if you can't tell me where it went, then what am I supposed to think? And when there has been reporting, I mean, this is not, like, I'm not, I'm not saying this is on you and that you caused this, but I think it's, it's a tough argument to I'm make sure that cause it. An, an $850 billion budget to an organization that can't pass an audit and tell you where that money went, like, I think most people would consider that somewhere in the realm of waste, fraud, or abuse, because they would wonder why that money isn't well accounted for. And especially when they see food insecurity on military bases, and they see... Do you want to talk about that? Because that's a good... We should be talking... I mean, well, I'm trying to understand where, where, where you're trying to go, other than the dollars, which really well, bother you. <laughs> I think it doesn't really bother me. I think it's all connected. Wait, wait. Okay, so tell look, me that story. Tell me that story. Just pausing it for one second to take a bit of a breather here and bask in this woman's abject condescension. And, I was told by Apple Care. <laughs> I mean, like, honestly, they, well, she's carrying all over the place, but it, it's also just jarring to see somebody say, well, the dollars really bother you. They really bother you that a great majority of our billions of dollars that we get a raise for on a yearly basis as we don't have a uh, public health care system in this country, as we don't have free college for all, which costs essentially what the yearly increase in the Pentagon budget is, that's what it would cost to fund free college for everybody in this country, and they get a raise without any kind of discussion. I couldn't believe it, so I wrote this thing down. The, the Senator Marsha Blackburn, her, her comment after, was, after the massacre, my office is in contact with federal, state, and local officials, and we stand ready to assist. In what? They're dead. What are you going to assist with? Cleaning up their brains off the wall? Wiping the blood off the schoolroom floor? What are you going to assist with? And then, you, and then there's Governor Lee. I, I, you know, I'm sorry to go on and on, but Bill Lee. I'm closely monitoring the tragic situation. Please join us in prayer. What are you monitoring? They're dead. Children. They're dead. The amendment, the freedom. You know, it's just, it's a myth. It's a joke. It's, it's just a game they play. I mean, that's freedom. Is it freedom for kids to go to school and try to socialize and try to learn and be scared to death that they might die that day? But Ted Cruz will fix it because he's going to double the number of cops in the schools. That's what he wants to do. Well, that'll create a great environment. Is that freedom? Or is it freedom to have a congressman who can make a postcard with all his family holding rifles, including an AR-15 or whatever? Is that cool? Is that like street cred for a Republican? That's freedom? That's more important than protecting the kids? I don't get it. You know, the greed of the gun lobbies and the manufacturers is obvious. We all know that. Money talks. But the cowardice and the selfishness of the legislators who are so scared to death of being primaried and losing their job, losing their power, losing their salary, You'd like to get each one of them in a room, just one by one, and say, what's more important to you? If you could vote for some good gun safety laws that most of the public agrees to, would you do that if it saved one kid? Or is your job and your money so important to you that you would say, screw the kid? Now, as he usually does, Pop hits on several key areas here, none more so than politicians being anchored to the gun lobby. Now, Coach Popovich mentioned Marsha Blackburn here, who is one of Tennessee's two senators who has received $1.3 million from the NRA throughout her political career. What happened yesterday in Nashville at Covenant School and Covenant Presbyterian Church, and my family and I are grieving along with the rest of the community, and I thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your call yesterday, your kind remarks today, and violence against children is just one of the most... Marsha Blackburn. I stand for the Second Amendment, and I am so honored to be endorsed by the NRA. Just how far Clarence Thomas is willing to go in creating an atmosphere of corruption on the Supreme Court, and just how much the Supreme Court refuses to in any way police its members. The latest reports come nearly two decades after the Los Angeles Times first reported that from 1998 to 2003, Justice Thomas accepted more than $42,000 in gifts, the most of any justice at that time. You know that Clarence Thomas knows he's in trouble because he finally has been forced to issue a written statement about this latest report, saying, early in my tenure at the court, I sought guidance from my colleagues and others in the judiciary and was advised that this sort of personal hospitality 
from close personal friends who did not have business before the court was not reportable. I have endeavored to follow that counsel throughout my tenure and have always sought to comply with disclosure guidelines. Joining us now is Democratic Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee and the chairman of the Senate Budget Committee. We're going to have to put an end to this business of having these nine justices be the only people in the entire United States government who are subject to no review of their compliance with the ethics code. Senator, I know uh, if a United States senator is new on the job and wants to know exactly what are the ethics rules on gifts and what do I have to disclose, you can just open up that rule book, very clearly written Senate rules about exactly what you can accept, what you can't accept, what you must declare uh, on a document, uh, uh, disclosing your gifts on the, through the course of a year. And yet you hear a Supreme Court justice say, well, you know, I just asked around the building. Uh, I didn't read anything. I didn't look at any document to guide me on what I can do. And uh, if they won't do this themselves, then one of the reasons for our judiciary hearings is to start setting up what a proper investigative method should look like for the court to apply. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, thank you very much for joining us once again tonight. Thank you. Thank you. There's three levels of maggot. There's maggot. There's ultra maggot. There's ultra extreme maggot. I cannot believe that this is happening. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I have a Trump hating judge with a Trump hating wife and family. Is Donald Trump prepared to be Tupac? Donald Trump is too much. Donald Trump's, that Donald, Donald Trump's base malls. If Trump had listened to me more, we wouldn't be in the situation. I think it's obvious. President Trump is joining some of the most incredible people in history being arrested today. Um, Nelson Mandela was arrested, served time in prison. I am very angry with the way that they have treated him to the point of crying myself to sleep. Jesus was arrested and murdered by a, the Roman government. Though they seek to arrest President Trump, we're declaring now that you arrest the enemy. We know that Trump uh, is God's anointed. You've already spoken those words. Okay, so we know that. Trump, whether you like him or not, has the eye of a tiger. He's got steel testicles, this guy. He's sort of the Logan Roy of American politics. He has this love-hate relationship okay, with his family. Okay, hold on a minute. Logan Roy is not a family man. Ward Cleaver is a family oh, man. Oh, no, no, I, I, you gotta watch the show very carefully. He actually loves those kids. Are you gonna run for office someday? Oh, God. Yeah. You think the average yeah. consumer of Budweiser is okay with this? I'm out. We fight the woke in the legislature, but we also fight the woke in the schools. We fight the woke in the bureaucracy, and we fight the woke in corporate America. Our bottom line is we do not surrender to the woke mob. Florida's where woke goes to die. One thing you kind of notice is that you know, feds are like cockroaches. You see one outside the walls, there's probably 10 behind the walls that you don't see. Look, the so, reason you all waited on McGahn is because the Russia hoax wasn't going well for you. And the reason you're okay, not waiting now right. is because you have no other legislation blah, blah, or no other solutions okay. for the country. And, and of course, yeah, of course I don't believe they're cockroaches. I was describing I, their propensity to be behind the wall and visible or not. It's, uh, my characterization wasn't intended to be derogatory. Yeah. It was intended to describe it, it, what it, a Florida it, it, man would realize about the propensity to see bait, something when there's bait. a... About maintaining within the citizenry the ability to maintain an armed rebellion against the government if that becomes necessary. I accept that Joe Biden is the president. I think that our election was uniquely polluted by these indiscriminate mail-in ballots. I think that this was the first time in America's history where the mailbox beat the okay, ballot. Do you think I believe that had mail, mail ballots not been sent to people who had not requested them, that Donald Trump would be sitting behind the resolute death. I, I don't. And the reason is those claims are not evaluated because in many of the circumstances you referenced, jurisdiction was the principal question. So I think it requires a review of the person, which I believe is a real failure of the judiciary. I think our, the Article III courts failed our country by not exercising more jurisdiction over those questions. Now, there's a difference in whether or not fraud existed and whether or not there's an adequate remedy. And I think also a number of those cases were kicked off. There was okay. no fraud if they didn't take up the question and review the facts okay. on jurisdiction or the, remedy. If the United States government brings charges, people can resolve those in the courts. Okay. Just, yeah. The stenographer is trying to take people's words down and she can't if everybody talks over each other. So. If Al Qaeda or ISIS attacked the U.S. Capitol, I would think that the least capable institution to bring them to justice would be this January 6th committee. I would far prefer the legal process to play out or the military process to play out. If the American people had to rely on the Congress itself as an institution to protect us from ISIS without law enforcement, without the military, yeah. it would be a deep, deep problem. Hey all, Glenn Kirshner here. So defendant Donald Trump is back in New York to sit for a second deposition to once again be placed under oath and ask questions about his corrupt and fraudulent Trump Organization business practices. Those questions are being posed by New York Attorney General Letitia James trial team. Letitia James, the Attorney General, has sued Donald Trump and three of his adult children, accusing them of a staggering fraud. And there's defendant Trump arriving for his deposition. You can see the Justice Matters protest sign there as he arrives. That's courtesy of the ever-present Team Justice warrior Kathleen. The latest in a series of legal predicaments entangling the former president, who also faces a separate 34-count criminal indictment unsealed last week. Predicaments, that's one word for it. Asks a judge to essentially run him out of business in the state if he is found liable at trial. Regarding Donald Trump pleading the fifth last time he sat for a deposition in the case brought against him and his children by New York Attorney General Tish James, here was the reporting by NBC News at the time. Trump invokes the Fifth Amendment nearly 450 times in New York Attorney General's civil probe of his business practices. 
Mr. Trump was not planning to assert his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, people familiar with his thinking said. People familiar with Donald Trump's thinking. He remains resolute in his stance that he has nothing to conceal, and he looks forward to educating the Attorney General about the immense success of his multi-billion dollar company, close quote. On the who will educate whom front, my money is riding on Attorney General James. What are the implications of Donald Trump pleading the fifth in this deposition versus actually answering questions substantively? Well, I'm pleased to report that for Donald Trump, it's a lose-lose proposition. In the setting of a civil case like this deposition in New York, if you plead the fifth, that can be held against you in the civil case. The jury will actually be instructed that during the deposition, Donald Trump pled the fifth 450 times. What does that mean? It means that if he were to answer those questions truthfully, the answers would have hurt his case in the civil fraud matter. So basically, a civil jury can hold it against you if you plead the fifth. So Donald Trump has already sunk whether he decides to testify the second time in a deposition or not, because those 450 invocations of his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination will be used against him in the civil case. However, in a criminal case like New York District Attorney Alvin Bragg's prosecution of Donald Trump, your invocation of your Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination can never be used against you. But here's the thing. If Donald Trump chooses to testify this time, as his attorney promised he would, because, you know, he wants to educate Attorney General James, if he testifies, every single word of that testimony will be provided to New York District Attorney Alvin Bragg, and every single word of it can be used against him in the criminal case. Because under the Biden budget plan, Biden has already reduced the deficit by $2 trillion, whereas Trump increased it by $7 trillion. That's just a fact. That's not debate. That's not hyperbole. That's just what's taken place. So Biden says, I'm going to be able to reduce the, you know, the deficit further by trillions of dollars based on my budget. Show me your budget and how you get to those numbers. And what are the MAGA Republicans doing? What they, they blame each other. You got McCarthy saying it's Arrington's fault and you've got, you know, saying it's Scalise's fault and just pointing fingers at each other. So what is ultimately going to happen as we get very close to where these extraordinary measures need to be taken this summer, you know, and where the extraordinary measures that are being taken run out? What happens then? What will end up happening is the Republicans are too incompetent to put forward a plan and they're just going to try to hold the government hostage. McCarthy's going to scream at them. They're going to scream at McCarthy. And what they'll do is the Matt Gateses and all those people, they'll take a vote to oust McCarthy. They'll probably tried to oust McCarthy this summer um, based on the fight over the over the raising of the debt ceiling while they don't propose anything. I think, unfortunately, there's going to probably be a short period of time where, you know, I, I hate to say this, but based on where the MAGA Republicans are going, they're going to probably force America to default on its debt. And then within a few days, because the results are going to be so harmful, they're then going to come around to finally raising the debt ceiling after they cause this harm, which I'd love to avoid. But these MAGA Republicans are, are arsonists. They're destructive people. I, I think that's what will happen. I think McCarthy will probably be ousted in the process. Um, and I think it's just further going to reflect how completely deranged and incompetent the MAGA Republicans are. But this infighting in the MAGA Republican Party, I think, is even more serious than has been reported so far. If you read between the lines, and I think Kevin McCarthy, I don't think Kevin McCarthy serves the full year. That's my prediction. We will see if that um, bears out. But um, I don't think he'll be able to get past this debt ceiling uh, fight without being uh, uh, without a motion to vacate. But we'll see. I never knew this, but I guess sushi needs to be frozen before being served in restaurants. The purpose is to kill the parasites that are present in fish. So the scientists wanted to see how it works by taking parasites from raw fish and putting them in a freezer. After a few days, he saw that the parasites died, but the eggs from the parasites were still present and were capable of hatching. According to the lawsuit that Alvin Bragg filed against Jim Jordan this week, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office has been inundated with racist threats against Alvin Bragg and his staffers. Here is what the lawsuit says. They actually put a couple of the threats in there. One person wrote, and language warning on this, I'm not going to censor it, this is what they said. Hey, George Soros, asshole puppet, if you want President Trump, come and get me. Remember, we are everywhere, and we have guns. One person called him black trash. Another person referred to him as AIDS infested. The list goes on. Now, as I've said since the beginning, it's only a matter of time before these threats turn into action from some of these truly psychotic Trump supporters. But it turns out the lawsuit already addressed that as well because it's not a matter of time anymore. Some of these threats have turned into action. As Vice reports, Bragg received an envelope containing white powder and a specific death threat against him. The letter was immediately contained to prevent exposure and was later determined to contain no dangerous substance, according to a letter Bragg later circulated to his staff. So while the letter with the white powdery substance was not actually a poison, they wanted him to think that it was. And of course, as it said, they included a specific death threat against Alvin Bragg. These people are psychotic. They are easily manipulated and they will do whatever they think Donald Trump wants, him, wants them to do. He doesn't have to spell it out specifically. But his continued threats against Alvin Bragg and the judge and the judge's family, you know, he's called Alvin Bragg a racist. He's called him an animal. 
He has referred to the judge and Alvin Bragg and other prosecutors as perverts, lunatics, and maniacs. Those are just a few of the words that Trump has used within the last seven days since he was indicted to describe these individuals that are doing their jobs. And let's also not forget the incident that we talked about, you know, a week and a half or so ago, where you had the uh, deranged woman outside the courtroom that pulled a knife on a family with two small children in strollers, asking them, waving the knife in front of their face, saying, do you support Donald Trump? These threats are no longer just threats. We are starting to see material action happen. Now, Judge Merchant, during the Tuesday indictment last week, said that a gag order is far off. Like, that is not something that Judge Merchant wants to do. Of course, that was before Trump and his family had started attacking Merchant and his family. So maybe Judge Merchant was going to have a change of heart. And he needs to have one immediately. There needs to be a gag order against Donald Trump before somebody gets hurt because we've already seen them try. We've already seen them try. It has gone beyond threats now. Merchant has to put that gag order in place and the gag order has to be so strict that if Donald Trump even thinks about violating it, he gets to go spend a night in jail. Real jail. General population jail. That's what needs to happen because Donald Trump knows exactly what he was doing with these threats. He knows exactly how these words that he is using are going to resonate with his base and he will not stop until he's either forced to stop or until his supporters do something that makes it to where he thinks he has nothing to worry about. If you are old enough to know better, you would understand why graveside services should only be held during the day. For you younger folks, I'll extend the courtesy of telling you that it's dark and you don't want to trip and fall into the grave. You might never be found again. This is a special graveside service with a preferred dark of night venue. Totally epic. <laughs> this is definitely the Gipper. You gotta be kidding me. Why hasn't the trickle down started yet? If you don't start spreading the wealth, you won't live much longer to enjoy it. My trickle-down economics theory was a promise of generosity to the people. Now the promise is broken and the people have no choice but to take your wealth from you forcibly. Greed is suicide.